And I, I make Tesla coils. Um, did this as a hobby purely because all of my other hobbies have generally become my profession, and I wanted to keep something that is utterly useless and cannot possibly be um, made into any form of business, because uh, otherwise it isn't a hobby. The ubiquitous safety talk. There are a number of things you've got to be careful of with Tesla coils. Electrocution is an obvious one. Certainly the um, spark gap ones start with 10 kV. You then put those up to 100, 200,000 volts. Believe me, it's the 10 kV that's more dangerous because that's got current in it. I've got explosion there. You may think that's amusing. I have seen transistors explode and they come at quite some force because they are a small container with a lot of power potentially driven by capacitors. That also explode when overdriven, get hot. Um, although, to be fair, most of them just spit out horrible electrolyte, which is poisonous. Burns, obvious one, electrical burns, but of course the arcs that these things produce are also very, very hot. Um, yeah, I've had RF burns. Hands up anybody who's had an RF burn. It is one of the most unpleasant sorts of burns you can get. It goes right the way down to the blood and it cauterizes its way all the way through and takes an age to heal up. You don't want them. It smells like roast beef. It smells like roast beef, yeah. Um, pacemakers and cochlear implants. If you're doing any form of Tesla coils, don't do it if you have either pacemakers or cochlear implants. I believe the people in this room can work out why. So we'll start with the history. Classic spark gap Tesla coil. You start with 240 volts, you chuck it into a 10 to 20 kilovolt transformer, it charges up a capacitor. When it gets to a certain voltage, your spark gap breaks down, pushing that charge in the capacitor into a small primary. Primaries on Tesla coils are usually between two and I think the most I've ever seen is 15 turns. That goes into a secondary. That is a transformer. The secondary has between 200 and 2,000 turns. By purely transformer theory, that's a very small amount of turns. That's a load of turns. You get loads of voltage in the top. It has nothing to do with the ratio of the turns. It is the ratio of the impedance. That becomes important later on when you're driving them, especially with transformers. With a spark gap, who cares? It goes bang. You get a big lump of RF wobbling around between the capacitor and the primary. That is a tuned circuit. It oscillates. Most Tesla coils I've seen are between 50 kilohertz and some of the really, really small ones about 500 kilohertz. Um, so you get a nice RF oscillation. That carries on until the uh, capacitor goes flat. Well, the capacitor into the primary, back into the capacitor, back into there. That keeps going around. Eventually, that runs out of power because the transformer is generally quite high impedance. So we get a big RF pulse. RF pulse, as I said, is multiplied up. And then you have a torus at the top, commonly referred to as a top load. It's effectively one plate of a capacitor. All capacitors have two plates, so 1K plate of a capacitor makes no sense whatsoever. Everything in the room is the other plate of the capacitor. They usually work out between about four puff, and some of the really, really big ones are 100 to 200 picofarad. Yes, just on a large lump of aluminium. I'm talking that kind of size. Dangers, as I say, high voltage. That, in your primary circuit, is where the high current is. Five milliamps across the heart is widely regarded as not being very good for you. Um, these transformers I've seen up to hundreds of milliamps. Microwave oven transformers are regularly used. They are lethal! I hate them. 2.4 kilovolts at about 100 milliamps. Absolutely silent. You can't hear them hiss, you can't hear any corona. So they're on, they're live, they're dangerous, you touch them, you're dead. Not a good combination. So, we'll start with the first really simple Tesla coil. You will have noticed that the spark gap has been replaced by a silicon spark gap, sorry, a transistor. It has exactly the same purpose. 
It will explode as soon as you put power... No, hang on. <laughs> it will try and explode as soon as you put power to it because it has exactly three turns on the secondary of usually quite fat wire. It is prevented from exploding by the fact that you get a little bit of inductance into there, into that secondary. I'll come back to the fact there isn't a top load in a minute which is driven, and there is an LED. This isn't my circuit, by the way. This LED does two things. One, it glows to show that it is on, cool. Number two is it rectifies that little bit of feedback, applies it to the base of the transistor in a vain attempt to turn the transistor off. If it succeeds, all fine, the thing bursts into oscillation. You have big multiplication of voltage, and you get a little diddy spark at the top that's quite poor, but it's only running off a 9-volt battery. It's great for amusing kids, and it'll light fluorescent tubes and that sort of thing. Of course, if that doesn't turn the transistor off, the transistor explodes, and then you need to feed more silicon into it and work out why. These are very, very commonly sold on eBay. You can pick them up for oh, 5, 10 pounds, something like that. And as I say, they're a brilliant um, introduction to solid-state Tesla coiling. A number of their problems. They are low power. I have seen the scale-up of that circuit. I've seen it with quite a large MOSFET and mains driven, and he had one big problem that he admitted on his site. Um, basically, he used to feed it with, I think, what was sort of a bandolier of transistors for when it didn't decide to start up because when he plugged it on, plugged it in, it wasn't at a zero or it was at a zero and it didn't get the feedback. You can make up all the stories, yeah? There's also no smoothing on there, which doesn't help for the initial current rush either. So, essentially, they're only for low power. The other problem is they're CW. By CW means carry a wave. They are on all of the time. Now, that sounds a little strange until you look at the actual magnetics here. Because if that is on all of the time, then you've got all of the power all of the time, and you're creating a discharge all of the time, which is fine. It gives you a hot discharge. What it doesn't do is give you very long sparks, because for long sparks, what you actually need is a lot of instantaneous change. Because it's CW, you don't get that instantaneous change. In fact, one of the ways of enhancing this circuit is if you put another transistor across the LED so that you can um, switch it on and off, it's like a 555, something like that, you can then actually get bigger sparks out of it because you're actually getting a big instantaneous build-up and then nothing. And the collapse of that magnetic field in there is actually what you want. There's also no storage. I said there was no top load. There's no top load because this thing works at an incredibly high frequency. It has to to stop the transistor from exploding. If that were to work at 70 kilohertz, that would take a hell of a current. The more top load you put in, the lower the frequency constant is of your secondary to everything else. So, essentially, it's not scalable. You cannot get big sparks out of it, which, let's face it, is what we're all after. So, we then go to the next version up, which is a solid-state Tesla coil. Yes, SSTC. Inventive name, huh? What we've done, we've taken the same circuit we had before, but we've got it interrupted. We're now using 240 volts AC rectified. Um, that particular one doing that was taking a couple of amps off the mains. We've gone to a full bridge, which makes it a lot, lot more efficient. Um, so we're taking rectified 240 volts, 320 odd volts, bridge rectifying it, so we're getting effectively 640 volts into the primary. We're using power MOSFETs. The downside of this one is we're actually limited by the resistance of the primary circuit, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I don't know how well you can see that. I was hoping it would go widescreen, it hasn't. This is the circuit. It really is quite simple. If you're looking at the other one, it isn't actually a lot different. So the single transistor has now been replaced by, in this particular version, I said it was a bridge, and then gave you a circuit with half a bridge. You can put the extra two transistors in. Um, 
So you've got a, a pair of something like um, 4PF, sorry, uh, yeah, 4PF 50s or something like that. Um, 20 amp MOSFETs found in most things, including laser switching supplies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, that powers the primary. The whole lot is um, powered by a um, gate drive transformer, which is by far the easiest way of driving MOSFETs in a Tesla coil. Mostly because it gives you isolation, and two is because it gives you all four signals in one, assuming you're using a full bridge. Paralleled up, dri paralleled up drivers to give you a drive into the gate drive transformer. Note any 555 to give you the interruption. So now we're getting that on, 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 which also means we can abuse these a little and possibly take them a little beyond their spec. Uh, the one that I showed you in that, di that photo, I think, was doing about 25, 30 amp pulses with 20 amp devices. If you ke keep it below their current dis dissipation, that works quite well. Um, I will come on to later how we can abuse that even more. Um, and then we've got a, a basic amplifier circuit, which in this one just says antenna. And that quite literally is just a piece of wire stuck up in the middle of the nowhere, tapping a little of the um, energy coming off the top load, capacitively. <laughs> it's one plate of a capacitor. So you get a little spark come out of there, it's picked up by the antenna, it's amplified, it drives it into here, those two transistors wobble the transformer, you get a bigger spark, it goes round and round and round. It is thoroughly controlled by the 555, its mark space ratio, to give you a decent amount of power without taking a lot. As is most Tesla coils, if you don't have that control, they are usually, to get the biggest sparks out, not ideal for running constantly. By not ideal, I mean usually you expect all of the components to be running pulsed, so if the pulses stop, your transistors explode. You will hear this phrase, your transistors explode, quite a lot. It's kind of the way that the electronic Tesla coils go. It's one good thing about a spark gap, you can blow up a spark gap multiple times. Transistors generally give you one chance. So, Pushing this a little further, this is a colleague of mine's coil um, in, the, in, in Scotland. Um, this is his dual resonant solid state Tesla coil. Now, by dual resonance, is what we've actually done is we've added a capacitor in the primary. Yes, just that. Not quite, but pretty much just that. So we've now got a, a tuned primary. Because we have now got a resonant primary, what we can actually do is we can actually feed this with multiple pulses. So rather than giving it one, we're now giving it bursts of RF. And because that's a resonant circuit, and because we're giving it the right kicks, we can actually build that like a swing. And we're storing some energy now in the primary as well as just in the secondary, the magnetics, and the top load. So we've got a lot more um, space for bang coming out of there. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the, uh, the, the things a little more. We've also got a different feedback system. We've added in this wonderful thing of current control. Now, much as I like taking transistors beyond what they're designed to do, you can also guess at it till the cows come home. We're running them very close now, so what we actually do is we're taking some control of it and putting the current in the feedback loop so that we at least know roughly how badly we're abusing the transistors. We've gone from MOSFETs to IGBTs purely because they are, their on resistance is so, so much lower, and they also have a very fast <coughs> um, tail off and DIDT. Um, they're basically like an SCR that you can turn off very quickly. Ideal for this sort of thing because that mim mimics that spark gap um, that we were looking at in the uh, previous diagram. And we've got spark progression. Now, spark progression is a wonderful thing, whereby if you make a spark, if you then make another spark immediately afterwards, the ionized channel is still there. So you don't get the spark of the same size. You actually get that spark plus that spark. And then if you do it again, you get another spark on the top. So 
100,000 volts will give you about that as a spark. Actually, probably less. Yeah, about that. So you do that twice, you can actually get that. And, and three times, you get that, and four times. But you're still only pumping 100,000 volts in the top. So what we've got is a multiplication of what we're doing with no extra electronics, no added voltage, no nothing else. And that is a big thing in DRSSTCs because that's what gives us the, the multiplication from the first coil that was sort of sparked like that to that sort of capability. So, it's operation. We'll start at the, the interrupter. Now you'll notice the interrupter here I have put on a fibre. There's a very good reason for that. It's generally you are holding that interrupter. Being connected to something that's likely to do two or three foot sparks is generally regarded as not a good thing. So we separate the user from the equipment by the biggest, op fiber, um, biggest opto isolator we can find, which is usually about three or four metres of fibre optic. But all that does is produce these sort of pulses. Those pulses go into the control. Um, and this is an interesting sort of... Uh, anything in blue is kind of control. Anything in black is, is the actual signal path. <coughs> so the control just literally opens that gate. So what that gate does is absolutely nothing because it hasn't got anything yet because nothing's come out of the top. So hang on, we'll start at the pulse. It gets a rising edge. It creates a pulse, a really short start pulse. That goes right the way through the phase detect and into the driver as just a pulse. Pulse goes through um, gate drive transformer, pulses the bridge. That produces a very small spark. But that very small spark um, is now detected by this current transformer. And all that current transformer is there to do is to feed a phase detect circuit so that we can put the right signals into this chain to drive your bridge at the right frequency and phase. So it goes all the way through, and then this time we get a much bigger spark because we've got a whole half cycle now. And this repeats, it does the other half cycle, and it will carry on until that control says, Nope, sorry, you've had enough. Now you also notice we've now got another current transformer. This one's separate to the first because it, it's being used for a different purpose, which is it is looking for actual current in the bridge in the primary circuit. Um, when that is ab above a predetected level, it actually tells the control to switch everything off. And you also notice it's very important we've now got this capacitor in the drive. The problem is you can't just switch transistors off when they're driving a large inductive load and especially a resonant inductive load. Because when you switch the bridge off, two things happen. One is that goes very high impedance, and two is the voltage across there skyrockets. Now the theory is that the voltage skyrockets, that gets multiplied by the transformer, and that's actually what produces the sparks, that's fine. But in an overcurrent situation, what actually happens is the transistor is at full power. You switch it off mid-transition. Mid, uh, and because we're pushing the transistors right to their absolute limit, the transistors go, whoa, I don't know what to happen this. You then get ground bounce, you get all sorts of wobble on it, and usually you lose a transistor. So what this control circuit also does is to make sure that it'll only turn off at a zero cross regardless of whether you're going over current in that cycle or not, because a hard transition will blow that transistor. This bridge circuit here, and in the... Let me just flip back to... That's now going to go more than one. Yeah, I thought it would. In there, what we're getting in there, that particular coil had... 1,000 amps, roughly speaking, on its primary coil at 620 volts, rectified mains. You'll be glad to hear that the transistors he were using were rated at 200 amps. And we'll come back to how we can get away with that in a minute. This is the expanded circuit. Um, Steve Ward, if you ever want to do anything electronic coils, he, he is the go-to reference. He was 
one of the two developers of the, the RSSTC circuit. And this is about the simplest one it can get. I've missed the, the bridge at that side and the transistors and the Tesla coil. Um, but essentially, we've got exactly the same. We've got a drive circuit. Well, actually, we've got two drive circuits. We've got a drive circuit driving a more powerful drive circuit. But he's actually now um, driving what we call bricks, which are big IGBTs used in the rail and car industries. Um, that they are physically the size of a brick. Uh, the big, big transistors. Um, and then, where are we? Power supply at the top. You've got interrupter, which I think is, um, is it? oh no, there is the optics there. So that goes in. There's a set of flip-flops that determine whether you are in or out of phase. Um, and then there is a signal pass from the where is it? feedback um, current transformer that, if you see, just literally are clamped, amplified, and then goes straight into a signal pass going straight out to a pair of flip-flops and the, um, the drive itself to the transistors. So essentially, we're back to that very, very first circuit of we've got signal coming in, being amplified straight out to the coil and straight, uh, straight out to the transistors and straight to the coil. He's added in an interrupter. The interrupter also determines what phase we're at, because again, from a manual control, you don't want to switch it off in the middle of a cycle. Um, so that's also there. And then we've now got the addition of this over current detect, which is a bridge rectifier against the um, over, uh, CT transformer with a burden. And then it's amplified, and there's a set of a, a, a range there to say anything over this. I'm going to flip a signal into this to, to cut it all off. So it's really quite simple. Apart from the fact that is quite the simple circuit these days. That there's a lot more in there now. Um, so I, I've mentioned about abusing transistors. And um, this is a general sort of transmi uh, transmission curve from gate to emitter voltage to collector emitter current. Now then, you'll notice here is there's a five microsecond pulse width. The coils we're using, five microseconds would be about flat out. So actually what we're doing is we're running those at one microsecond, sometimes 500 nanoseconds sort of pulses. You'll also notice that the gate to emitter voltage only goes up to 10. But the device itself says a gate to emitter voltage up to 20 is perfectly acceptable. There is also the problem, like any transistor, it has gate capacitance. So you've got a real bad storm here of large gate capacitance with a very small pulse. So we have to drive that gate really, really hard. And we do this two ways. One, we put big hunking drivers in. Um, I've got a little battery-powered Tesla coil, and that has 14 amp drivers to the MOSFETs. And then the MOSFETs are running at about 300 amps, rated at 50. So what we actually do is we go, okay, 10, but we're getting up to 20, and we've got less of a pulse width. I'll get my ruler and pens out, and we take that curve, and we're going to extend it off this way somewhere, and that's roughly where we run it, way off where it says on the data sheet. <laughs> the problem with that is it's absolutely fine as long as you can get the heat out of the device. The devices aren't designed to do this. So you have to be very, very careful when you pick your die and bonding to make sure that you can get the heat out. Because we're probably only running it a couple of hundred watts, but with megawatt pulses. <laughs> it's quite normal. 300 volts, 300 amps, a megawatt pulse. Might only be for one microsecond. Um, so that, that's the way we abuse that transistor. That, well, any of the transistors we do. And we do it purely because if we wanted a thousand amp transistor, they are around four or five hundred pounds each, and we want four of them. Whereas a 300 amp transistor that we can abuse to a thousand amps is in the region of 20, 20, yeah, 20, 30 pounds now, something like that. And of course, we're not running them solidly on. 
quickest thing about gate drive transformers, that is a gate drive transformer, hand wound, all of the cores together. It literally gives you five windings, one in, one for every transistor, and then you just flip them over to get the right polarities on all of the, the, the bases. And then you just literally clamp that, just make sure there's no sparks from coming. Although where you're going to get interference from, I've no idea. Um, talked about the control. The, the circuit I showed you used general logic. Uh, so just basically time as an analog. I've now got one that uses microprocessors for most of the control. FPGAs are coming in bid style um, because of their speed and the flexibility of them. And because of that, you can now do envelope control of the voltage going into the bridge in the first place. And there are ways you can persuade Sparks to do some very incredible things. That is an entirely different lecture. But um, some really interesting stuff coming out on that. Um, the biggest thing with all of this is the overcurrent cutoff timing, as I've said. It's got to be fast, but it's got to be ideally at a zero cross. I said in my introduction, uh, Tesla coils generally suicidal. Other than the transistors trying to destroy themselves, primary strikes, which is a spark from there down to there, happen quite regularly. The shape of the top load stops that from happening because it actually produces like a magnetic field kind of um, static field around the top. Tuning is a big one. This coil actually failed. I don't know if you can see the sparks running up and down there. That is not normal. That failed because um, it got a, pri a strike to the secondary. It disconnected one of his turns on the, on the secondary coil and put it out of tune. And that's what happens when your coil's out of tune, is that every, every coil sparks to the next one that's in phase all the way up and down the coil. It looks really pretty, makes a superb photograph. He was so hacked off. <laughs> um, bad feedback is, is probably the other major one. If you don't get a good signal coming back from either your um, current transformer or from your aerial, then you're going to fire it at the wrong phase. It will start to oscillate at what that uh, loop timing is and not at its resonant frequency. And then you'll get that sort of stuff as well. I run two testicle meetups if you're interested. Uh, one is Nottingham Gas Fest, the other one's Cambridge Teslathon. I'm going to be around for a while, please, please ask. And I want to thank everybody that's ever shared anything on Tesla coils because it, it's an arcane art that the internet has made very, very accessible. And I'm, I'm massively thankful for that. So, brief questions. <laughs>